Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Xiaobing Shen. Um, I'm, I'm from Ant. Unfortunately, my colleague Natasha is not feeling well today, so I will be your host today. My colleague Susanna is also host, co-hosting today's webinar with me. This webinar is part of a webinar series co-sponsored by ANTS and the Council of Australian University Libraries on theme of research data information integrations. Our previous three webinar has already covered the DMP tools, system managing ethics, and the data storage. The recording of these three webinars are available on ANTS YouTube channel. And today we will talk about the data publishing. First of all, we would like to acknowledge our co-sponsor, the Council of Austria University Libraries. We would like to thank them for their support. Secondly, we would like to say acknowledge Commonwealth Government for their support of ANTS and ANCRIS programs. So with that, let me introduce our first speaker, Dom Hogan. Dom is from Saro Research Data Service Support Team, Information Management and Technology side. Today, Dom will talk about data publication at Saro. Dom, over to you. Uh, yeah, g'day everyone. Uh, thanks for having me along. Um, so, just to explain the broader context of data in CSIRO, um, I have this little slide here from what things looked like about 10 years ago, or maybe a little more than 10 years ago now, uh, and we had about 20 or so, or actually, okay, I've forgotten the count, but the, we had a number of different, um, what were called divisions at the time. And uh, each of these pretty much ran their own show. They got their, their portion of CSIRO's funding, and they had their own departments, they had their own libraries. Uh, and there was collaboration between divisions, and there was collaboration between the libraries. There was a, li a CSIRO library network. Um, but um, all in all, there, there, were very, there were varying standards of, um, of information management throughout the organization, just due to the nature that they were run separately. So around that time, uh, what happened is that there was a change to the formation of uh, information management and technology. And so this was one service for all of the divisions in CSIRO, um, which at the time included IT libraries and records. Uh, and that, was, uh, that allowed us to take a unified approach to, say, uh, data storage, um, networking, computer infrastructure. Uh, and so two of the things that came out of this uh, was the publications repository. So we were able to uh, merge our legacy publication citations and also have a unified uh, approval system for uh, new publications from 2009 on. And we also got working on uh, data.sara.au, which is uh, our uh, data repository. Now, as I said before, with, with those uh, many organizations that we had, had within the CSIRO, uh, some of them had very high data management standards and then others had well, yeah, much lower standards, not uh, due to the needs of the research. Um, so, the, yeah, the bringing in this uh, data repository, actually, uh, there there would have been some organisation, oh, some part of parts of CSIRO that actually felt that they had things pretty much under control and they weren't really in need of a new repository, uh, whereas other parts of the organisation had been really crying out for this sort of thing. Uh, so the goals with this uh, repository was to provide persistent access to data. Uh, and also version control. Uh, so this sort of enables the, um, the reproducibility of the scientific outputs uh, so that you can actually get down to individual versions of what you have. Uh, and the other goal there was um, self-service, which so we wanted uh, CSIRO researchers to be able to just log on and create their own data collections, write their own metadata. Um, now that's, uh, that can sound a bit scary, it's like can, uh, you know, we're, maybe researchers can be forced to write bad metadata. Um, so far what we found is that the people who are using it are the people who really want to use it and some sort of they want to get their data out there and so they usually uh, put the effort in to write fairly decent standard uh, metadata. And there's also an approval system in there so that uh, the approvers can go through and suggest uh, reviewers and uh, there's, a, there's a little bit of peer review that can go on there. And another goal in here was scalable storage. So as we have many, many terabytes or petabytes um, of data coming in towards us in the future, uh, the way to store this, so the, say maybe how things were done before, is you would have, um, a, let's say, a file server with as much disk space as you could put in there and files sorted however they happen to be. And um, there, there's an expectation that those files will be available to me right now. Uh, I'll, I'll be able to get them. Um, but that's a very expensive way to host data. 
uh, especially when you're getting into the petabyte scale. So what the, the DAP and what other parts of CIRA storage go in for is this, um, these different standards of storage categories so that uh, data that maybe need to be preserved but doesn't necessarily need to be accessed instantly at any given time uh, can sit on tape and then when it's requested it's loaded from tape onto disk where it can then be accessed. And so I've uh, taken this slide from Ian Corner and Renee Tighouse who uh, work in the storage area of CSIRO and this is, a, this is a bit of a model of their idea uh, of a, a scientific workflow where in, the, in our cloud, what we have here is, uh, are the various storage categories. And so the researchers don't need to think of the individual machines hosting any of this data. It's somewhat abstracted from them. All they have to do is uh, know what the address is, and then the storage team actually takes care of the rest. Uh, so they, they don't need to migrate between servers when there's an upgrade to the hardware. Uh, they can just keep pointing to the same address. And then you have these different storage categories like input, uh, you have the um, verified work and static. And so they are actually stored on different media with, uh, that are optimized for different uses. So the static reference data may be sitting on tape and then reloaded later on when we um, need to reprocess it. Uh, and you can also see that the, the idea in there is that as, the, as a project goes on, it would be moving the data through various quality control processes and, and eventually to publication. And the publication part, I guess, is where the data access portal comes in, but not always. Sometimes it can be a domain repository um, and then various parts of CSIRO have, the, have their own sort of ways of managing data. But we're trying to move towards uh, having one unified repository that at least catalogs uh, everything in CSIRO. Um, and we're, you know, we're making progress. So, the data access portal itself. Now, hopefully no one can read this because I realize there's a few errors in this diagram. <laughs> um, but what, um, what I'm trying to represent here is that the, the data access portal is not really just one system. It's actually a few systems that play together nicely. So uh, what we might have, I don't know if anyone can see my mouth, the mouse cursor here, but so with our SORA researcher, they're uh, entering metadata into the user interface and uploading, at the moment, uploading their data to an SFTB staging server, uh, which is all fairly straightforward and most researchers get that done without ever asking for any help. Uh, and then of course you've got a database that uh, stores this data or the metadata um, and also assesses the, the data files that come, comes in and records some uh, metadata about the files as well. And then that all gets sent off to this thing called the Logical Collection Manager. And what's happening there is uh, this is the thing that uh, takes in the requests for data or takes in the submissions for data and then decides what to do with it. So uh, if the data happens to be someone's requesting data from tape, so we have our research community and they're saying either asking the user interface or the web services interface for some data, then the logical collection manager is going, okay, well that's sitting on tape, I'm going to need that to load that off onto disk here uh, so that then some, somebody can then download it. And the thing about this tape is that the main um, delay that happens here is that the tapes themselves move data very fast once they're loaded. It's just the waiting for the robot to actually load the tape. So even for, say, a, a collection that is maybe hundreds of gigabytes, typically this will only take about you know, 15, 20 minutes uh, before somebody gets the notification saying, hey, here, here are the files you can start downloading. Uh, and then I also wanted to talk about some of the other systems that feed into this because uh, what we're discovering is that we're going to need to set up this sort of uh, what we're referring to as the data ecosystem. Um, so the, the various different uh, services and utilities that interact with each other to provide a, a broader network of uh, data capability. Um, <coughs> now here I've got this sort of big database store of SAP, that's our uh, organizational uh, information system, although I believe there's actually more to it than just SAP, uh, so take that with a pinch of salt. But anyway, that, so that's, that's one system, but it doesn't necessarily present the data for easy use by other systems. So what one of the teams in IMT have done is uh, create a series of different web services, which uh, just for developers really, I, I don't think there's much in the way of a, a user-friendly interface to any of this. Uh, that takes information from here and from other sources of CSIRO, so like the publications repository, uh, and um, formats that in a way that then any other, say, service or application in CSIRO can then use. 
So the data access portal uh, grabs our business unit information and our project information from SAP, but through these web services. So we don't really need to know how SAP works, we just need to know how these web services work. And um, yeah, they're, they're a really great piece of infrastructure that sort of sits underneath things. And uh, I, I think a lot of the uh, a lot of the glory goes to the end applications that wind up doing great things with these, but these these basic web services are what support that uh, and enable that to happen. And so then once we're in, so this is just a screenshot of the um, organizational data uh, coming through to the data access portal. So the user is entering their information, they've selected their business unit, and then they select their team. Uh, and there's other information in there that goes so you, so you can get project information, information about who the project leader is, uh, and things like that. Uh, and, and of course, we could integrate more of that in the future. So for instance, there's uh, an interface to our publications repository, so we would be able to, it conceptually, uh, say, what other related publications pick from these, you're listed as an author, that sort of thing. Now another thing that happens here with the DAP is uh, we, we, we've got various different research groups that have already got metadata in their own systems, their own databases, and they wanted uh, to put these things in a repository. So these formed pilot projects. Uh, so we had the, a microscopy group. They have a very complex database and a lot of information about their um, microscopy images, uh, and they wanted to transfer that over. So they've got their own interface for doing that, uh, which sort of semi-automates the process. So they grab the system grabs the metadata out of their databases. Uh, and then gets the uh, the user to just polish up the record, fill in, finish off the complete uh, DAP collection record, and then they have it in the repository. And a similar thing goes on with the uh, the astronomy collection. So the first one we set up was the one for pulsar observation, and this represents a very large volume of data uh, that also gets used quite a bit uh, and internationally. So it's been quite a success, uh, and they also have very specific information about their radio astronomy data that uh, are that the, they have a custom search. And uh, a recent addition to this is the uh, another set of uh, radio astronomy data. This is for the, um, from the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder project. So uh, I have a slide about that now. So this is just a sort of indication of the workflow um, that really extend, ends with one point in the data access portal, but there's a lot that happens before this. So you have these uh, antennas, and eventually there will be something like 32 of them, and they transfer a tremendous volume of data to what's called the correlator. Uh, in fact, this data, the volume of this data is really too big to actually store. Um, it, it would be extremely expensive to set up a supercomputer that could do that. So what this correlator does is that then compresses that data down into something that can be transferred to the, uh, the Pawsey Center, and that that data gets processed into what is actually stored. So rather than being, uh, I, I think at full capacity, it's going to be something like five petabytes a year. Um, I can't, I didn't write the number down, but it's a, it's, it's a truly scary volume of data that they're dealing with here. Um, so they crunch this down and then actually store what they're going to store in the data archive. And then they have several different ways of interfacing this. So they have their, what they call the CASDA application. So that's the CSIRO ASCAP Science Data Archive. And um, the astronomy community generally uses these virtual observatory tools, which are it's like programming interfaces to access the data, and they can query the data. And just uh, because you can't really download this volume of data, that would be crazy. Um, you, they use these programming interfaces to just query it for the data they are interested in. Um, but there's also uh, part of that is gone into the data access portal so that people that can just use that user interface there and also search for data and request just the small portions of data that they do want to actually download and use. And then this is another one of the systems that the data access portal interacts with. Uh, this one's, it's an open DAP sort of threads server and this is just one example of a, a fairly popular collection we have which is a, a hindcast of ocean waves. What, what they do is they create these NetCDF files, and the NetCDF files have embedded metadata. They have information about what fields they are, and we can see over here that we have um, information about the layer, what the units are in. There, there's a whole catalog of various different data sets stored this way, and the beauty of the OpenDAP services is that it provides various uh, methods of accessing the data that um, just by, by default. So here I've shown an example of the mapping service. This is just a running in my browser. But uh, in theory, uh, another spatial portal could just link to 
the data services that run on top of this and then access the data in their own mapping, custom mapping service for whatever purpose they happen to have in mind. And so what we have in the data access portal is a set of metadata for the collection at large uh, and that just points to these uh, open depth services. And uh, at the moment, we, we only have a handful of collections that use this, but they are very large. And then the hope is to um, improve this so that uh, any researcher can just point to an arbitrary open depth server and say, this is where my data is. Uh, and that could include um, you know, uh, services at NCI or other, other institutions. So uh, here, um, now Oceans and Atmospheres, this uh, used to be called uh, Marine and Atmospheric. Now they have their own metadata catalog for uh, quite some time. Uh, and they have their own data center with uh, various databases uh, and, and ways of accessing things. And what came up for them is that the, the new ship, the RV Investigator, uh, is collecting a lot more data than the previous vessels ever did. Uh, because it has a lot more instruments and higher resolution instruments. So they were looking for a way to store this data securely uh, and also minimize the problems of actually transferring that very large volumes of data over the network. So what we do is we grab metadata from their system. They can write it still using the way they're used to doing things. Uh, and they transfer the tapes to our system. And we can actually just plug those tapes straight into our tape library and it behaves like other DAP collections that have already been prepared. Um, and so what happens there is that they are able to share that with their university collaborators for the quality control process of the data that comes off the ship and then prepare that into data products that then go public. Now here's another example, Land and Water, that's a group within CSIRO, uh, and they also have had um, a very high standard of data management over the years. So they have this uh, metadata catalog that they use internally and they use this through the working life of their project. So they have a have a file server set up and they have very strict naming conventions on their folders and files and then they, um, as they go, they, well, what, certainly what they encourage their researchers to do is to uh, write metadata, uh, this is just ANSLIC standard metadata in their system and then what we've done is we've, uh, so for this one and for the marine and atmospheric one, we've enabled the ability to just basically upload the XML. So this, at the moment, that's ANSLIC or a marine community profile metadata can go in through here. And uh, when that's done, so this is just an example of one that's come through. So they've, that's created the, the DAP record. They can move their files in there and make that public, or they can just share it with uh, individual people. So we have uh, different restriction levels that we can add to different collections. Um, so we can restrict access to the files but leave the metadata public or we can leave, um, restrict access to even the metadata. So there would be some collections in the system that I can't find even as an administrator because I'm restricted from accessing them. Uh, and now one thing, I'll just skip back to this previous slide. So you'll see here that this one gets a DOI uh, and what's, uh, we've got some policies around what gets a DOI, what does not get a DOI. So for instance, this one, has restricted files. We can see our little padlock here on the files and when we click on that we get told, oh, you'll have to log on to access that. So this, for whatever reason, maybe commercial sensitivity or um, the licenses of source data, they aren't able to share this data. What they get is they get a handle uh, instead. Now we are currently discussing amongst the team about maybe relaxing this so that metadata records can get a DOI. Uh, there's a little bit of debate going on there. Uh, but certainly the, the researchers would be very keen, um, a, a lot of researchers are very keen to use DOIs uh, as a preference for anything that they uh, cite. And then uh, this is an example, so this is a licensed data set, I didn't want to show one that I can't show to anybody because it's restricted. So this is just one that, that you can get through Geoscience Australia and we've got our own copy in there just available to CSIRO staff so that they don't have to go download it again. And so when we do that, we don't get a DOI and we don't get a handle. This is just using an internal ID system. Uh, and so this, this will only show up to CSIRO staff who log on. And then we've got version control. So uh, this is a bit of an example of a software collection that's been going through a few different versions. And uh, each time a new version gets created, uh, if it's a minor update, say just fixing a typo, then the DOI is uh, maintained. So you'll get several versions, but you'll only get, but you won't get a new DOI. Uh, but in the instance where the data changes, so they, this is an actual new version of the software, 
Uh, and you can see that there are also subsequent versions that have new uh, contributors to the data. Um, so when those versions come through, so if they've changed something significant about these attribution statements, people in it, the title of the collection, they get a new version and they get a new DOI for each one. So what's in the future? Oh yeah, and one thing I have completely neglected to talk about is the, uh, the development we're doing of a um, data management plan tool. And so if we think back all the way to that uh, workflow where we were looking at, uh, I'm going to, no, I won't skip that, it's too many slides. The, um, when we think back to that workflow where we had the different categories of storage while researchers were working on their data before publication, this is, uh, they are starting to collect information about the files and information about what happens to those files as it goes. And uh, that combined with the data management plan tool where researchers uh, describe what they're planning to do and how they're planning to store things. Uh, we would like to get that metadata feeding into DAP collections so that they already have things written by the time they actually go to create the DAP record and there's less, so people maintain that metadata as they go, uh, so look, there's much lower transaction costs, as one of my colleagues says, um, when they're creating the metadata rather than uh, remembering everything right at the end. Another thing we're working on, uh, a number of research groups have been very keen on us setting up some features that would support linked data. So we've got semantic web features coming up, like uh, a persistent URL service, which is a generally useful thing. Uh, what we find is that a lot of researchers would want to uh, get DOIs, um, but they may not really understand the policies around using and maintaining DOIs. So they might think of a, UI, uh, a DOI as just a persistent URL that points at whatever you want it to point at, which is maybe more like what a Perl would be. So uh, there, I'm seeing a need, and certainly for linked data there's a need, to have persistent URLs that you can define the policies around. Uh, and so having an institutional-wide persistent URL service that both the data access portal could use, but that any uh, research group could use for tracking any object. It could be a person, it could be a data file, it could be a piece of software. Uh, and this would uh, lead in towards things like provenance tracking, where you can actually identify each Thing, each um, part of the process of the research workflow and record this uh, and then that should improve transparency and reproducibility of the research itself. Uh, we also are looking at vocabulary services because that will be uh, much, if, if for nothing else, uh, improving the way we enter keywords into our collections, but uh, there are numerous applications for vocabularies. And then, oh yeah, so the, the main thing about this semantic web features is not to have, say, we're going to implement this all in the data access portal um, because there are other parts of CSRO that would like to use these services. So things like that persistent URL service may be its own entity. Uh, so I think the thing that the researchers are really looking for is the persistence uh, and the, the reliability of it still being there in 10, 15 years time. Uh, and they want, um, so that, you know, they might be working on short-term projects, they may not be able to guarantee that sort of support for themselves, but uh, they're hoping that the organisation can support that and have that commitment to it. And uh, the other thing we're working on uh, with the web services interface is programmatic creation of collections, particularly for a data collection that is fairly routine. So we have, say, some geologists who are taking a lot of um, samples and scanning them, and they would like to just feed those scans and information about those scans straight into a data collection that they, they can then reuse uh, later. And so rather than manually going through and creating it each time, which um, is really infeasible at the moment, having a program that can do that for you, uh, that's what they're, they're looking for. And so we're in a testing phase of that right now. And so I can't get through this without acknowledging the support of the Australian National Data Service, who funded quite a lot of the development of the DEP. And uh, also, that I took one of those slides from Ian Connor and Renee Tyhouse from their presentation at eResearch last year. There is a cast of thousands that have worked on this over the years, uh, and this is by no means all of them. Um, <laughs> these are just a few people that I'm working with uh, lately. Um, so thank you to them, and uh, thank you for listening in. Do we have any questions? Yes, Dom, we thank do. You, Dom. There's a couple of questions here. What do you use for project IDs? Is there a national service? No, we're just using internal identifiers for projects. So this is really just, um, they're, they're probably codes that wouldn't make much sense outside of CSIRO. Uh, that's why I didn't really go into a huge amount of detail about that. 
So I, I guess uh, there's certainly for projects that do have that sort of national scope, there's no reason why that couldn't be set up. But at the moment, it's really uh, codes that are sort of specific to how SAP works. There's also a comment from the same person who says that they're pushing ORCID to supply these. I'm not quite sure that would work as ORCID is pretty much just a person identifier as far as I remember. Uh, yeah, well that's definitely on the list of things that we're trying to implement. So we want uh, to register ORCIDs. And because it's an opt-in thing, we can't just say, hey, everyone in CSIRO, here's your ORCID. Uh, they have to actually volunteer for that. But um, yeah, we, we, we definitely want to link ORCIDs from both CSIRO researchers and external collaborators who are listed into records. Uh, that, that, those are one of the identifiers that I think would be very useful. Um, and so when I was talking about persistent identifier services, you know, to, to, to fill in gaps because there are all types of, say, objects that um, would could benefit from this that might not be covered by uh, an internationally recognised service. The next question is, what is the policy you mentioned around DOIs? Is it publicly available? I'm not quite sure what means. Is the policy publicly available or whether the data is publicly available? Okay, so the policy on DOIs, uh, I'm probably going to have to pass the buck on this, but um, I, I believe we can share it. I'm not sure if we've got it. I don't know if I could point to a website that hosts it at the moment. Um, so I'd either, well, I, yeah, I'll pass the buck to one of my colleagues. If, if I can get a, you to take a name down for that, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to get back to you. Yeah, so um, and back then, to, she's come back to say it is the policies that she wants to have shared. Yeah, yeah, I, and I, I believe that is actually part of uh, our, if Sue Cook is in here, um, you could pass control over to her and, or give her a voice. I think she's got some comments to make about this. She has she made a comment that says the CSIRO DOI business rules are on the ANS website. Oh, there you go. Okay. And others yeah, have asked the policy too, so they are on the ANS website. Okay, another question is, are there are any of the open DAP components available for other research institutions to implement or use? Uh, yeah, I believe open debt, I don't think we have a custom implementation of that. Um, I'm, that's actually managed by um, a sort of a data, data services team in CSIRO who are linked to the high performance computing team. Uh, so I don't, I'm probably going to guess that none of them are in this webinar. But uh, yeah, as I understand, I, I believe that's some open software that they have implemented there. So I don't think there's anything special about what we've done. Certainly, I know the um, uh, Nectar or the NCI have some threads servers going, and I'm sure the Bureau of Meteorology do too. So uh, I, I don't think there's anything particularly novel there. Uh, may, maybe there's a few implementation details, but uh, I can definitely put you in touch with um, Gareth Williams, who would be uh, more than happy to talk about that. <laughs> um, Jerry's made a comment, Jerry Ryder, who's from ANS, she says, with regards to pearls for projects, ANS has a service for ARC and NHMRC grants. Okay, and I think for the moment that's all of the questions that have come in. Thank you very much. All right, thanks, thanks Dom. Helen is the UQ Project Manager of Scholarly Communication and the Repository Service. Today, Helen will talk about data publishing at UQ. Helen, over to you. Hi, good afternoon everyone. Um, I was really pleased when Natasha got me to talk about data publishing because here at UQ Library we've been trying to build a bit of a solution around that, um, particularly for the long tail of research data here at UQ. So I have said it specifically about data publishing at UQ Library because I'm very aware there are some groups around UQ doing some fabulous work in this space, but I will focus very much on what we're doing here in the repository. Um, so thinking about data publishing really raises questions of why we're going to do it, how we're going to do it, how are researchers going to gain credit for the data that they produce, and um, particularly how they're going to gain the credit it's separate from and in addition to the analysis of those data in publications. So what we're really trying to look at is really how we can build those meaningful con connections between publishing the data and publishing the, the scholarly work. It's actually um, my favourite part of the data lifecycle, data publishing, because it can be both the beginning and the end. So it might be that you're tidying up your data at the end of a project and looking to archive it. But if you go one step beyond that idea of archiving your work and you really start looking at depositing your data or publishing it, um, you really are giving sort of the start of another, of another project. You're really, really putting your data out there to become the beginning as well as the end. So there's been talk for a while now about making data a first-class scientific output. Um, here in this paper from 2012, 
They discuss achieving that through formalising the methods for citation and publication, and thereby sort of incentivising data sharing. And I think that's really important when we go around talking to researchers here at UQ, is to really make sure that they're understanding that the incentives behind um, sharing data, if we talk about the data with them about being a primary research output, that really starts to click with them and they start to understand um, more often where we're coming from. Crucially, a point of difference, which we talk about with um, researchers, is around um, archiving data versus publishing data. So if when you archive your research data, that can be obviously very beneficial in terms of um, preserving the data. But when you publish it, it allows for things like validation and peer review of the data, which really enhances science as a whole. So we're, we're going to researchers and um, talking to them about not only the academic credit that they'll get, but also about that the results of their work will be verified by others, that they'll be able to um, expose their data to this idea of peer review, which to some of them can be quite scary, especially when we're talking again, like I said, to that long tail of research data, who perhaps aren't as familiar with this idea as data sharing as others. But that, um, you know, we're really trying to provide a mechanism to ensure the quality of data sets available. So at UQ, what do researchers want? When we go out and talk to them, what is it that we're saying that they want? They, they would like, I think, um, research data archiving, somewhere to preserve their research data, a way of sharing it, a way to publish their research data in a way that treats it as a primary research output. And that's crucial, I think, as to why we've implemented the data publishing um, infrastructure here in our institutional repository. We very much wanted researchers to feel that they were going through that process of publication in a similar way as they would with their other scholarly work. Um, we do talk to them about peer review and verifiable results, making sure their results are validated and reproducible, and the idea of getting academic credit. But I'm just putting all these words in their mouths. I'm not sure, do researchers really know that they want that? So when we go out and talk to people, we've, we've done a lot of work in this area, and we're very lucky here in the library to have a team of librarians who work in research output services, um, as well as our client service liaison librarians. So we're able to go out and talk to researchers um, about what they actually do want. So we did a couple of things. We've continually evaluated our data management service since 2014, as well as collected user stories from people. So they tell us that the largest ever data sets they work with perhaps aren't that big. You know, we are really trying to provide this facility here for people who don't have other options, who aren't working in these big, big areas, which perhaps provide these nice, fancy um, workflows for them. So they're telling us they're not working with huge data sets, but that they have many different types of data. That their storage locations for archived data are a little concerning, that they will store it on their external hard drive or on their computer. So we know they want to preserve their data and they want to save it into the future, but that perhaps they're not, they're not sure about how to do that. We know that 53% of them wanted to keep their data permanently. So the idea of data archiving isn't something that they're adverse to. They're, they're happy to keep their data permanently. But it's taking that next step and actually publishing the data, sharing the data that perhaps we're trying to facilitate. So these are some of the real user stories. Real researchers said this. These aren't things I've made up. And um, that they want to store their research data in such a way that others can cite it. That seems to be really important that they get credit for their work. That they need access to institutional repository storage solutions for the data, as required by the journals they intend to publish in. So we did a bit of um, an environmental scan recently where we looked at, for the past five years, everything that UQ has published. We analysed those publications by um, journal and by funder. And then one of our data librarians went and dug out for the top 25 journals um, by productivity, so by sheer number of publications at UQ, um, and also by um, overall time cited, so you could say by an overall um, total number of sites for papers in certain journals. So we got two lists of top 25 journals, one for productivity and one for overall time cited. What we found were there was policies for those journals. Um, only seven out of 25 in terms of sheer weight of numbers required data sharing, still a lot, seven out of 25. But in the highly cited or you know um, journal list, uh, the 25, 18 out of the 25 had a data sharing policy in place. So we know that UQ researchers are publishing in journals, um, a huge number of which, 18 out of 25 of which, um, are requiring them to share their data. So this researcher here isn't unusual. And the most frequent phone call we're getting at the moment in the team is people who are trying to publish their research data in a journal, 
that's requiring them to deposit their data somewhere and they're looking for a solution to that problem. They also would like stats on who downloads their data, so that's a little bit more difficult to, to work through for them, but they are interested in who's looking at their data. This researcher said they needed to be able to securely store their sensitive data, but also share it with other researchers and collaborators. So we knew that we had to build infrastructure that made um, sense to people who had data that perhaps needed to be mediated access. This person would need to be able to permanently store their research data in a way that was open and accessible in order to meet the requirements of a funding agency. So as well as analyzing QQ's research output by journal requirements, we did the same for funding agency requirements. We looked at all the funding agencies named on UQ research outputs in the last five years, and we found that there are multiple um, funding agencies that are putting this pressure onto researchers to make sure that their data is open and accessible. That's both um, Australian ones as well as international ones named on UQ research publications. We knew that they wanted to store and accommodate all their research data along with everything that goes with it. So they need facility to upload data dictionaries, metadata, lab notebooks, so that it can be used by researchers in the future. So these are all really great um, user stories to come from our researchers. These are really good use cases that we're able to accommodate using our institutional repository. And I do think that over the, over the years that we've been here and talking to researchers, very much the conversation is starting to change. And we really are changing that terminology now. So people are beginning to start to talk to us about data publication instead of data sharing. And the conversation is really, I think, the start of a culture change here at UQ, which is, I think, very good to see. And the idea that researchers should share data to advance knowledge and promote the common good is quite an old idea. But in recent years, you know, we're really seeing a lot of enthusiasm from them. I think because people are starting to look at how um, they can get that academic credit and how it can lead to very much a conversation around research integrity and an audit trail from raw to published data, but then also from the published data to the publication. And I think that's where you get very strong trustability. And this is what we're working towards, is um, really the idea that data is deposited alongside and at the same time as publication of any scholarly output. So at the time that a UQ researcher is publishing a paper, that we give them an easy workflow and a trusted system for them to deposit the data that goes along with that publication and link the two things together. And really by integrating the data publishing with the other publishing, we're giving them um, real credibility, trustability. So it says here in this paper, data stewardship is best accomplished in systems and repositories where the custodian has trusted status within the relevant communities. And again, I think that's why it fits really well in the repository and really well with the library. But it also requires robust infrastructure that's quick and simple to use. And um, we first implemented the form, which I will show you very shortly in, in our repository a couple of years ago. And it has gone through a number of iterations where we've tried to make it very user-centric and very um, straightforward for researchers to use. We do want them to do it. We want them to deposit the data. We want them to describe it. Um, so we're trying to make it so that they can use it and be confident that, it, that it's a straightforward workflow. So if it's going to become part of normal scientific practice, it really does have to be easy to achieve. So when researchers come and talk to us about um, publishing their research data, we will quite often talk to them about if there's a discipline-specific repository, because I do feel that those are very, very relevant for certain researchers. And we talk to them about, instead of archiving their data on their external hard drive, perhaps you know go and use a, a, a specific repository like that. Or we tell them also about UQE space. So the fact that they can actually describe their research data in UQE space. We talk to them about the idea that data that underpin a journal article should be made concurrently available. And we talk to them about the fact that we can link that data metadata record with their publication metadata record. They can be shown to be related objects, and I think that really does, they start to really understand then the value behind what we're trying to achieve here. Um, we make it discoverable, so we, we obviously send all our research data metadata up through to Research Data Australia, and then we also send that through to the Data Citation Index, so we're able to track citations of their, their data sets through that, which has been um, really a key thing, I think, for people to really comprehend um, the impact that this can have, which is really good. 
So I'll show you a little bit more about how, but we have this need some extra help email data at library. So we have a generic email address there, which comes through to the team um, here in the library. We're very lucky to have some very skilled and specialist data librarians working here. We have, yeah, I suppose it's a relatively small team, but a very, um, very dedicated team that work, work very hard to process these records as they come through. And to really have those conversations with researchers articulating clearly the relevant funder and journal requirements and um, that they can use the institution repository, that it's known, that it's trusted, that it can integrate with their other publication workflows and link to their other related um, publications or data sets. We try and really keep it very researcher centric and build them a profile of their data set. Um, we can give them DOIs for the data sets, we show them how to license the data set, we show them how to cite it um, and how they should be showing other people how to cite their data correctly. We still find a lot of people just either acknowledge a data set or mention it somewhere in the paper, so we're really trying to push that now it's a proper citation. And then, you know, we, we can do things like if their data is actually stored in a trusted subject-specific repository, we can link out to that, or they can upload their data if it's a fairly small data set. They can choose mediated access to their data, or they can choose open access so they can actually link to it or upload it, or they can just have a contact person so that so that people are aware the data set exists, but that they would like to mediate the access to that. And we can also add an embargo period if required. So if somebody comes to us and says they need six months, 12 months embargo period on the data set, we can facilitate that as well. So this is what UQ Space looks like, the home page. And when you log in and you go into My UQ eSpace, you'll notice here you can see um, My UPO options. That's something that only an admin can see. So a researcher starts with the tabs, my research, possibly my research, add missing publication, then they have two more options, my research data and add missing research data. And I really think by having the data sets up there in, in, in that prominent, along with the publications, gives the right message, it gives the status of research data as a primary research output. So they know they're getting the list of my research publications, they know they can um, claim publications that might possibly be theirs, and the system will present those to them, that they can add publications if they think we're missing them, but that they can also get a list of their research data, which comes like, it looks like this. It, the data sets below are currently attributed to you, and people really like this, this page. But then they can also go to add missing research data set, and this is what they get. They get um, It's a fairly simple form, and like I said, we've gone through a couple of different iterations, and we are actually looking to and we design all the forms in this space, at which point it will get a bit of a facelift, but I think we're pretty happy with the, the fields that we've got in there at the moment. So the person goes in, they add a simple amount of metadata, not too much. All the mandatory fields are up top, so they can fill those in and get, get a lot of that done very quickly. They go through and they can add access conditions. So this is where they'll tell us if they'd like it to be open access or mediated access. And this is where they'll pick um, a license in terms of access for the data set which we talk to them about in great detail because obviously if you're making your data available online, you need to make sure that you're releasing it under conditions that you feel comfortable with and that also allow for reuse. So we talk to them about what the different restrictions on the different licenses mean. Um, we talk to them about copyright and whether or not copyright exists in their data. If copyright doesn't exist in their data, which quite often is the case in Australia, we talk to them about UQ terms and conditions which is a very simple thing that says you could very welcome to use my data, do anything you want with it, but I'd like you to attribute me. So we talk to them about various options around licensing in terms of access, just to make sure that they're feeling comfortable. I think for some people it's quite a new idea that they're just going to put their data out there online or publish their data online. Then we go through various things. They can upload their work, they can add links to the location of data, if it's for in Pangea or Dryad or another repository, for example. And then they tick a little deposit agreement that says they're the creator or the co-creator, that they're authorized to deposit it, they've got permission to include any third-party content, that it's original, doesn't infringe any legal rights, and that by depositing it, they're granting new QE space, a license to reproduce it and make it available. And that the data that creators' moral rights will be to be associated will be respected by UQ space. And then before the record's published, it's checked by one of our specialist research output librarians. So every record that comes through, um, every time a researcher says, add missing data collection, they fill through the metadata, 
Um, it, will, it doesn't go automatically published online, it comes through to our team. Um, we check very carefully through the record and we quite often will contact the researcher and speak to them about the metadata that they've provided and make sure that it's um, a rich resource because I do feel if you're publishing data, the metadata you provide around it is very important and to make sure that that data and metadata is consi of a consistently high standard would be certainly an aim that we have here at UQ Library. So then you end up with a final record. This is a record from the eFish Genomic Database Repository. They're a great group here at UQ. They analyze all these amazing fish or sharks um, and they get all the genomic information, of which they say they use roughly about 3% of the information that they collect. And then they're very happy to make the full, full amount of information available online. And you can see here we've got the file actually attached there so people can just download it. And we also have a link through to the full text publication. So we're making sure that you've got that trail from the data set to the publication um, and also to any other related publications or data sets. And I do think that's the, um, the main thing here by popping all this information directly into the institutional repository. It's really giving us that advantage and that integration with, with other aspects of public publishing, which is where you're going to get the credibility, I think, with, with researchers. This is the second half of the record. You can see they picked their Creative Commons attribution but non-commercial license. It tells you about the type of data, all very standard metadata, but enough for you to go off if you're going to try and discover the data set. So in the future here at UQ Libraries, some of the plans that we have really center around creating more of this researcher-centric data management um, infrastructure. So we have a couple of different projects on the go at the moment and um, funded by the Enhancing Systems and Services um, suite of projects, I guess you would call them, um, here at UQ. They are trying very much to provide this umbrella and university-wide infrastructure that's really going to help researchers sort out their workflows. And that includes um, management and use of the data from a DMP all the way through to storage, preservation and reuse. So we expect this will tie in very closely with the existing information that we have in eSpace. We know from our user research that researchers require that easy to use infrastructure that's available to them at no cost and that allows for best practice workflows but with minimum administrative intervention. So we're not trying to give them an administrative task to do but we're trying, almost like Dom said, to be collecting that metadata earlier in the process so that by the time it comes to the end of publishing they're not having to remember everything, that they've already got quite a well established um, set of metadata by that point. So currently at the UQ Library, we do have a DMP online tool. There's no flow on a metadata from that into the repository. And there's no links to storage provisioning. There's no links to published record metadata. However, we are well positioned to capture that information in eSpace because we know we've got the, the infrastructure I've shown you now. We've got that complementary um, projects around data sharing. We know we can do the licensing, the DOI. We can send it through to RDA. We can send it through to DCI. So we know we're in a good position to do this. We've done an awful lot of brainstorming, and I like the little bit there on the wall that says can do. It's like we know we can do this. There's also one that says it's my data. I'm not publishing it, but I don't believe that one. Um, so we really are going to work towards thinking about um, having an idea of project level minimum viable metadata, which can be fleshed out into a DMP, which can have um, other information added to it, we really are at UQ trying to look across a huge number of different disciplines and they all require something slightly different and a few of them have different ideas as to what data publishing even is. So by keeping this idea of minimum viable metadata at the project level, keeping it very simple, um, that allows I think for as, as wide as we can possibly get at UQ coverage, although we're not trying to go for everyone. Um, I said at the beginning there are people at UQ doing this really well without us, so we, we're not trying to um, overarching trying to get onto get onto all of those people. But for the people that don't have working systems, um, the new system will allow research project level metadata captured in a DMP to cascade through the data lifecycle, automatically provision data storage, and then we can use that information to to publish one or more data data set metadata records linking back to the original raw data um, and also linking forward to a set of publications that came from that project level and um, data collection. 
So I think that's a really good situation to be getting into, and certainly that's the vision, although I think it would be um, not coming probably, I'm going to say 12 months, giving me a year for this, but it's certainly the direction that we're heading in. And um, I've got a quote here from Vincent Smith who says, the power of published data is amplified by ingenuity through applications and uses unimagined and uses unimagined by the original and distant from the original field. Without connecting these disparate data sets, the true potential of data reuse and repurposing is lost. And that's from his paper on data publication towards a database of everything, in which he has the idea that perhaps we can um, I want to say coagulate everything into one large, huge database that can be queried and solve all kinds of interesting problems. So I really do think that publishing data is something worth investing a lot of infrastructure, you know, a lot of money, a lot of thought, a lot of infrastructure into. And um, yeah, something we're very excited to be part of here at the library today. Thanks, Helen. We look forward to hearing more from you in one year's time. But for now, <laughs> Susanna, let's move to the question time. Any questions? Uh, yes, there is one there. Is it possible that UQ can share their list of journals that require data publishing? I'm about to start working this out for the journals that ACU publish in, and it would be great to have a central repository for this information. So Yes, I'm very happy to share that information. Yep. We did look very specifically at UQ publications, and they um, and then slice the data just everywhere we've been publishing, but I'd imagine it would be very similar across the the university, so I'm very happy to share that information. That sounds fantastic. Um, so what software are you using is the question. Um, we use, it's an in-house, it's just the, what's used to build our institutional repository. So I do believe it's all open source and online, but yeah, it's all the in-house development stuff. Mm -hmm. Apart from the DMP Online, which is um, an implementation of the DCC's um, DMP Online from the UK, Obviously, you wow them with your brilliance there, Helen. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for your time. Thank you.